Auckland University Professor Sean Hendy joins me now to explain the significance of having one active case in the country. Sean, the number one, how big a deal is that? Uh, it's, it's a huge deal. I mean, it, it, we really um, should be reflecting back um, on, on where we were um, early March, um, you, you know, on, on the same trajectory as, as many countries overseas where we've seen the disease really spread out of control. Um, and so, so to get that down to one active case and perhaps just be a few days away from, from zero active cases um, and, and that elimination target, it's, it's quite an achievement. So let's say we watch the press conference or get, get the media release tomorrow and they say no active cases. Can we say we've eliminated COVID? Not, not entirely. I mean, at, at this point, it's kind of a statistical game. Um, you know, we, we, we know we probably missed a few cases, right? I mean, the, 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 the case count that we've got, um, you know, no country in the world is, is absolutely sure that they've identified all cases. And, and, and this is the tricky thing about this disease is, is there are people who, who don't have strong symptoms at all but can still be infectious. And so there's always that chance that you'll, you'll, you'll miss those cases. And so that's really the risk we're, we're managing at the moment. Right? We're very confident about the cases that we, that we, um, we know about. You know, we've managed those well. We've, we've, people have isolated or gone into quarantine in order to pre- prevent the spread to other people. Um, so that, that's been done well. But there's always, the, you know, there's this diminishing chance now that there are still a few cases out there that we don't know about. And so that's the risk we've got to, we've got to manage. From here, though, you know, that, that risk starts to become smaller and smaller. The, the, the more days that we see zero cases, and, and certainly once we go to zero active cases or zero known active cases, then the risk starts to shift to our borders um, and, and incursions from overseas. So when we get to zero active cases, how long do we need to be in that position before you would call it and say, this is elimination? Yeah, so so you know it, 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 there'll be a statistical threshold, and and so sometime sometime in the next week, um, you know we've been we've been running our simulations this week to see to see how many of those simulations give us the kind of results we've seen over the last couple of weeks, and then how many how many of those go on to eliminate in the next week, and at, at the moment this weekend, ninety percent of our simulations will be eliminating. Um, so we can have a sort of a 90% confidence level that actually we've no longer got um, active cases in New Zealand. And that will that, that should give us some reassurance. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's good news. We, 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 we went to level three and we didn't see an uptick in cases. We've been in level two now uh, for a while and we haven't seen that uptick in cases. Um, but, you know, there's still that chance that, that there might be that one or two case, uh, you know, unknown cases out there. And as we come back together... As we sort of go through these thresholds, get back into social gatherings, there's the possibility that we'll have another spreading event and we'll, and we'll see more cases. So it's about it's a risk management exercise at this point, Lisa. So in terms of your modelling then, could you put a percentage on what number of cases you think are undetected? Is there any way of estimating that? Oh, look, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, 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 there's sort of big error bars around this at the moment, but we're, just, we're talking about a handful of unknown cases at, at this point and maybe zero. I mean, and that's what our simulations are telling us, that we're very close to that zero number. Um, so, so I think, you know, pe- people, we've still got to be cautious because there's still that chance of, of, of border incursion um, uh, over the next months as, as we do start to relax borders. Um, but, you know, so we've got to maintain our caution. But we can, we can get back to something like life was um, uh, back in February over the next few weeks. OK, so if you say about now we could be confident 90% there, we're 90% there, what does that number have to be where we should be opening up a trans-Tasman bubble then, given alongside that number you're saying, well, the borders are the biggest risk? Yeah, so, so I, don't, I don't think there's a... You know, it's very hard to express that in, in pure, purely in numbers, right? It's going to come down to a judgment call. Um, you know, we, there, there are a lot of things in place now to protect us against a further outbreak. You know, there's our contact tracing system. Um, there's our testing regime. And then there's the kind of controls we have at the border. And when you pull all those things together, you know, that's, I guess that's the thing that Cabinet's going to be looking at. It's going to be drawing on all these different bits and pieces, and it'll have to, it'll have to be confident that we've got all those things in place, as well as the, you know, what our modelling is saying 
which is actually, you know, we're, we're pretty confident there is an undetected cases out there. Okay, so this is your area of expertise, modelling, and I know you have looked at the scenario of a bubble. Would we need every state in Australia to have zero active cases in order for you to be comfortable um, travelling back and forward between them? No, uh, that's that's not necessarily the case. I mean, we can we can you know, and it will depend on how we do surveillance at the border. I mean, we you know, New Zealand, um, you know, we, we we do this in biosecurity all the time, right? We we manage the risk of of introduction of of pest species or um, or pathogens at our borders, and so it's a similar situation. We're going to find ourselves in a very similar situation uh, to the way we might manage biosecurity, where it's where it's about it's about risk. And, and, and trading off the benefit of allowing people to, to travel, um, you know, be re- reunited with family members, get back into tourism to help help our economy um, in, in that sector, uh, and we'll have to balance those risks. So I don't think there's a sort of a there's a pure number that you can express it on. Um, obviously, places that that you know start start um, achieving numbers that are similar to ours, you know, they they should be higher on our on our list, and we can we, you know we can engage with them much more openly. Um, and, and maybe that's the thing to do early as we as we test our systems, as we get more confident in the controls we have at the border. So if we're doing so well, which we seem to be, why do we need to or do we need to stay at level two? Um, I, I think I think now is the right time to start talking about level one. Again, it's kind of this risk management exercise. You know, what's going to be happening now in level two is we're going to be having those large gatherings again. Those those large gatherings are, you know, not only risky because they're, they're, um, it's the opportunity to spread the disease amongst many people, but they're also the th- sort of um, events that challenge our contact traces. So when you've got to trace, you know, the 100 people that were at the bar, um, that puts a lot of strain on our contact tracing resources. So those are the risks with those kind of events. And I think we just have to, we have to take that cautiously and step through those changes um, as, as we head back to normal life.